is the career panel at Oceans. Uh, it's sponsored for, uh, by IEEE Oceanic Engineering Society. Um, the idea here is that we can introduce a group that's diverse in their career choice and career level, and they're going to give us an idea of how they got to where they are today, their successes in their college, and the things that you know formed their current career. Uh, and then I'll answer questions at the end after they give a short presentation. But since not everyone is here yet, we will let you ask some questions. And Mike over here is live. So you can come and ask some question. That wasn't quite what you had in mind. <laughs> that happens. Are you ready to for any of that? This really was just an unofficial question. <laughs> just to build the time. But good morning. Um, I'm Alexis. I'm a student. I'm just curious. Uh, before I got here, which I'm sure you'll say again, um, who you guys? as well as how you got to be where you are today. That, that is what the panel will be about. Um, but we can go ahead and do introductions. So why don't we just go down the table and have everyone introduce themselves and let us know uh, what their current career is and sort of what they, they see their career level as. You know, if you're either a young professional versus a senior level. Um, that's Absolutely. So John's been looking at my talk. 
It's because I, and it's really refreshing, and my name's Nicole Buff, I'm the Acting Assistant Minister for the National Ocean Service. And um, everything I wanted to say, as I will at some point say today, has to do with um, taking the opportunities that come and not getting on without being on a particular career path. So this is sort of very organically, we're here to maybe talk about some of the same things. Um, it's sort of where I got started. I grew up um, on the Gulf Coast of Texas, and so I grew up playing on the beach and watching dolphins and crabbing and fishing and all that good stuff. And so I was very connected to the place and very connected to the coastal environment. Um, by the time I got to kindergarten, I was set and knew what I wanted to be. My mom saved this thing that said I wanted to be a dolphin trainer. Um, it's not exactly how it turned out, but you know, actually in the zone. Into uh, becoming a um, sort of marine mammal specialist and specialist in the marine mammal protection act. So, um, we'll talk again, but I'm not quite sure how far to go in the narrative, so um, talk about that later. But I have stayed um, very connected to the place, um, which is something that I think some people have and some people don't, and I don't think it's good or bad um, if you have it or not. But um, it's something that's always really, really kept me tied to um, purpose. Or somebody else's place, if I can see that there is connection to that space and that, the value of that space, then, um, then I think the commitment from that flows. And so that's something that's always kept me passionate. Uh, I'm really starting to connect with the fellow Tanzanians. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> we just met each other. Like, oh, yeah. So I like, the, I like the non steady state and circuitous nature of career uh, thread that's emerging here because. Uh, what I've told students from my entire career, which mostly was at Savannah State University, which is down the road from here, uh, about 35 years, uh, is that the, the only proper uh, path to a career and through a career is the one that you choose, not any outside expectations. It's very personal, internal, driving, state of nature. <laughs> so my name is Matt Gilligan. I'm a professor emeritus uh, at, in the Department of Marine and Environmental Sciences at Savannah State University. Professor emeritus means that I retired, turned over my salary to the state of Georgia, and uh, uh, really had so much fun there that uh, I applied for emeritus status and was granted it, which is kind of the title, but it allows me to remain engaged in ways that I choose, and uh, it's a way to continue a career forever, as long as you wish. Um, so I get to go, go do things like uh, speak at the dedication of marine science research centers that, that we never envisioned back in 1980, when it was just a little fledgling marine biology degree at historically black college. And uh, you know, things have uh, worked out quite well, so that's kind of a, a long steady state of but now, just recently, um, my career has taken a little bit of a job by being here. Um, and the fact that in uh, June of this past year, I received a presidential award for excellence in uh, science, engineering, and mathematics mentoring uh, in Washington um, with a bunch of other mentors and teachers. There's teaching awards and mentoring awards, and they have been accumulating in the White House for quite some time because I was an honor. Before I retired in 2011, <laughs> and was just notified that uh, you know there was a panel that recommended me in 2015. So you know, patience is a virtue. <laughs> I guess it's an, another kind of uh, recommendation. Um, so that that's kind of reinvigorated my career because it was two wonderful days in DC of engaging in lots of ways to uh, sort of reinvent. Uh, advocacy for STEM education and diversity kinds of directions. And this came up in one of my former students, who's now the uh, director of conservation at the South Carolina Aquarium uh, here at Charleston, uh, a former student of mine, who I've remained very much engaged with in terms of mentoring. Mentoring can be a decades and lifelong adventure uh, with individuals. Uh, so he, he and Jeff Payne um, uh, conspired to get me up here to do this, and I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you. That was an excellent introduction.
production. Um, we are now about 15 minutes in. I feel like if someone was lost, they might have found us by now. So uh, let's go ahead and one more time just introduce, as we're going to talk about, we introduce ourselves and then do our, our five to 10 minute presentation on how you got to be where you are today. This is the full deal. And, uh, and after all of our panelists have finished, we'll, we'll take questions. Uh, hi again, uh, um, so I am from Portugal, but I've been going and studying in Italy for the past 10 years. Uh, when I finished my master, I wanted to try something else. That's already a last ambition. Well, it's not healthy if you stay the whole life in the same place sometimes. Because you want to go to be really of a system, so if you stay, do your master PhD all the life in the university, that was the top progression rate and the uh, share knowledge uh, among the uh, So I decided to uh, do something else and move uh, away from Washington for a bit. Uh, I got this uh, Marie Curie Research Researcher scholarship for two years and I thought, should I run the museum? Should I not? I thought, sure, if I would like Italy, if I would like the place. So I didn't do all the I wanted to be, and that's also okay. Wait and try, and maybe if you don't like give up and go somewhere else. So, after three years, I liked it, uh, and I decided, okay, I'll take the PhD here, this is a good place to be, and it's, I saw some career opportunities opening up, and I started the PhD. During my PhD, I think there's two very important things I did, uh, and I advise you to, to do. One is to be visiting the PhD students in other universities or research institutions, go around as much as you you might need to find a supervisor about that, uh, but it's worth and uh, you will see that maybe later you get the job to one of those institutions or to some other uh, uh, conference. So as one of our said, always try to have all possible opportunities you, you can get. Summer schools, travel plans, promotions, anything that you are interested in, just ask a supervisor to go. And don't feel that you're losing time and that you should be in the office doing your research. It's also important. To meet other people, to see other people's uh, jobs. Uh, then, when you get closer to the end of the PhD, and after fighting a lot, and never we have a feeling lost, feeling that it's useless, do not give up. And don't think that uh, that's just you. Everyone has those moments. Uh, it's normal, it's okay, and don't get overwhelmed from that. When you get closer to your PhD, you probably want to start looking for a job, let's say six months before or something. But again, don't be too stressed that you need to teach your PhD and find a job immediately. If you did your network properly and you went around for a bit, then you probably come up in the way. So your career path will open to you normally, smoothly, uh, and you should, you should never uh, be overwhelmed or over stressed about no, what I'm doing here, why I'm doing this PhD, where should I go next. It will just flow, flow with you. Well, and try to. Uh, a lasting uh, regret that I had to find something else. 
And yet still people think that, um, I guess young people have the expectation that they're supposed to get passionate about something and have this clear path mapped out in their mind about where they're going. And if you don't have that clear path, or you haven't really got convinced about what you're passionate about, um, there's, a, there's a, a sense that, well, people are expecting more of that. You know, I have to have my, my act together. I, mean, I don't want to waste any time. I, there are people who get a very clear vision of what they're passionate about and relentlessly drive in that direction, and that's great. Um, but I think, frankly, the majority take a lot longer than that to find their path uh, through their true life or through their, their career. And even more than that, I think a lot of paths are kind of like a random walk. You think you basically want to head from this lamppost toward the club over there, but as you kind of take a step, something happens and you walk the curve and it's one way, and then you take the next step and it's kind of not quite the same direction. And sometimes you end up and you face the lamppost again. But you do eventually tend to wander off, get further away from that post, and get at least something. So, uh, in my case, uh, I was quite good at maths and physics, so that's what I did. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was passionate about it. It was kind of fun, it was good stuff, and it seemed like it was a lot less work than history or geography or other stuff that had quite huge essays, you know. So, so I, I'm basically lazy by, by uh, inclination. I don't like to do any more than I have to. And uh, that's actually a key ingredient for mathematician uh, because they really want to solve the problem in a general closed form so they can apply it to a thousand other problems that have to more separately. Um, and so I did mathematics. And then I did uh, quantum mechanics and cosmology and uh, general relativity and this was wonderful and I got a place uh, to do a PhD on uh, studying the condensation of galaxies, which I still think is a really interesting problem. Um, and then I realized that, you know, I was kind of tired of doing academic stuff and burnt out and I probably needed a break before I went on to the PhD. And so I started looking for a job that I could do for a year or two. And um, I didn't find anything very, very suitable. Um, and then a friend said, oh, you should, uh, you should check this out. And he'd been down this place with a job center, which I didn't even exist in. And uh, gave me this form and it was for a British Antarctic Survey. And lo and behold, I shot for the interview on the basis that, well, I'm not likely to get the job. Right? There's at least 150 applicants for these jobs. And they're going to pay you to go to the most fantastic place on earth. So, so, so I showed up. And um, they said, yeah, well, this is, this is looking good, yeah. And I said, there's only one problem. I'd like to do a PhD. I don't really want to work for you for like four or five years and then do a PhD because it's going to take too long. So that's not a problem. You can do a PhD on research. I said, Wait a minute. You're going to pay me to go to the most astonishing place on earth, and you're going to like, you know, buy all my clothing and feed me on there and that kind of stuff. You're going to give me equipment to go and do some research, which was on ice melt and ocean circulation, very early basic uh, climate change study. And you're going to support me to get a PhD out of this. And I'm, I'm in. Only problem is I don't know anything about astronomy. And they said, well, yeah, it's just not really. Mass and physics, I can learn. Okay, I said, that's fine. <coughs> so that's what I did. So I'm in Cambridge, I'm going to be in Antarctic four times. It was fabulous. Uh, I did my PhD, I got a PhD in glaciology and oceanography instead of cosmology. And uh, right at the end of the, the PhD process, I'm, uh, I'm giving a talk at the Department of Biomass at the University of Cambridge. And there's a professor up at the back, and he struck this deal with this, this marine research place in Italy, which fast enough very well. And uh, they want to do some experiments to test a theory about random focusing of sound in the ocean. And uh, the, the professor at the back actually developed this theory for, for the pulsars and quasars, but it should also work for acoustic propagation in the ocean. And uh, the thing is, He's been told he needs to find someone who understands this obscure um, theory about random volume scattering and random focusing of waves that he can send out to Italy to help the experimental part do the right experiment. So he calls me up in his office and I go to see him. He says, Well, I've got this offer for you. Okay. What is it? He says, Well, it's Italy. Uh, 
uh, it's tax free. Uh, it'll pay you about you know, two and a half times what you currently get. Um, and you have to do uh, random, uh, random, inoxygenous volume scattering, random focusing theory. I go, sounds great, but I don't know anything about acoustic propagation. I know that's not fun. Well, oh, that's not a problem. We did massive physics, right? <laughs> So I thought, well, okay, if you say so. And so I took a job, right? I thought, well, what's the worst they can do? They're fine, they can't do it there. So I took a job, studied random focusing for a few years, became an animal acoustician. Uh, that worked out very well, I had a lot of fun. Uh, then I got into my head to sail to uh, the States, which I did. Uh, got another job, uh, also in local acoustics, but this time in acoustic uh, imaging, using sound. Worked at Scripps for a few years. And, um, but I wasn't really smart enough to, uh, to, to do that well at script. It's extremely difficult to do well at script. And to, unless you're a world famous professor, um, basically they, they want you to pay them to work there. So I thought that was kind of bottom feed of the script. And uh, obviously there was not a lot of upwelling going on. And so at a certain point, I got excited about Asia because this was the days of the Asian tigers. And the sort of awakening of the idea that really interesting stuff was going on in Asia. And so I went to Singapore and started a acoustics lab and uh, co founded the Tropical Marine Science Institute in Singapore at the National University of Singapore, which no one heard of at the time, but it's now it's about number 20 ranked in the world, um, top in Asia, and I had a blast for 12 years. So I lived in Singapore, um, grew this lab and started learning a lot more about mentorship and leadership and uh, empowerment and teamwork uh, and people things. And when I came out of that, um, came back to uh, Europe and became much more interested in um, how we need to improve our um, understanding of social behavior and uh, people to get politics and policy lined up so that we can address serious problems in the world. I really think we have the technology. We don't need more technology. We need more uh, coherent will to apply it in an effective way to solve our problem. And so in the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been involved more with uh, strategy, um, change management, strategic planning, and I'm now much more interested um, in how do you get people lined up line behind some common vision about you know, something you want to get done. And um, as of January, I finished my work at uh, the NATO Centre of Italy, and uh, I'm now glorious for unemployed, and looking for the next challenge. And at this point, I'm much more interested in finding a challenge where I can really create some value for people, where I get it that my experience and background multidisciplinary, multinational, um, and working with drawing together teams of people, how can I use that in a really meaningful way to create some value for somebody? And that's what I'm looking for. So I still have that. Thanks. Hello again, my name is Nicole Hoover. I'm the acting assistant manager for the National Ocean Service for NMS. It's one of the um, arms of in three days, I will have been with NOAA for 21 years, right. um, which is almost as long as I've been on Earth, so that's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, but NOAA is a fantastic place to work, and if you're a visual developer, it's a because I know, right? Because we're always trying to bring in the best of rights. Um, I um, consider myself a marine biologist, but more than that, um, I'm a bureaucrat. Serving is the, the kind of way to say it, but I absolutely love serving um, the, the American people on um, all sides, and um, it's just something I've been passionate about service for a long time. Um, I, I think I'm at the top ish of my career, which is bizarre. Um, I am um, now acting as the head of an agency that has um, about 1,700 people in uh, facilities all over the United States doing such a wide variety of activities, um, but all um, centered around protecting the coast.
coasts, the coastlines, and the oceans and the communities that depend on them. Um, so I've been passionate about that for a long time. I'm very excited to be here to talk about career paths. This is, um, again, pretty special that we all have these diverse career paths because it was only in August that I um, kind of figured out that I had a career path. Um, it's taken me a long time to kind of become comfortable with that. People ask me all the time, you know, tell me about how you got here, and um, I, I sort of just told chronological stories, I did this and that, and this and that, I think the point um, that um, John made about um, uh, not getting, you know, you don't have a straight path. I was always looking for a straight path, and why am I not on a straight path? And it seemed that others were on a straight path, and how do I, how do, I do that? So you can look at my resume and see, you know, the different things I've done, I've worked for um, and um, sort of get a sense for the chronology of things. But what you might not glean from the resume, right, or the CV, is um, where um, I believe that I've contributed the most to Noah's mission. Um, and you certainly won't see um, where there took the biggest leaps of courage to go from one job to another. Um, and you won't see the accomplishments that I am most proud of. So um, what I wanted to do, rather than chronologically, tell you sort of where I've been, what I've done. I wanted to provide some examples of some of my proudest achievements. Um, not to brag, and many of these achievements will mean nothing to prove exactly because we don't have the context for them. But I want to give you a sense of the diversity of the accomplishments that I've had in my career. Um, the, just the wide range of experiences, but also I believe as a leader it's, um, it's compulsory that we give you a sense of who we are as people. And so if I tell you the things that I'm the most proud of, I hope that gives you a sense of who I am as a human. Um, and I think that's kind of something that's important. So I'm going to just run through a few things that I did to do some reflection. <coughs> um, so I have a, a background in marine mammals and have made um, significant advancements in how NOAA reports um, its marine mammal stranding data. In fact, I was um, leading a team that uh, documented first case of tomoic acid poisoning in marine mammals in the United States, um, seeing hundreds of California sea lions on Grand Nile seas. Um, it's pretty traumatic. How do we document that? And how do we make sure that the next folks that come upon the symptoms know what's happening and can get tissues sampled? Um, I'm considered one of the experts in the U.S. Marine Mammal Protection Act. I know all of its nooks and crannies and its history and its intent, um, and that's really fun. I've been reading this since I was 18. So that's sort of a strange geek of mine, um, but that's something I'm very proud of. Um, I also had the opportunity to recruit for this role to uh, oversee and develop a, a comprehensive process for getting about $1 billion back into NOAA's budget during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill when we put our planes and boats out there to respond to that spill. Um, there are mechanisms to get reimbursed for those things under the Global Pollution Act that NOAA had done scale um, and the breadth that we had, and so that was something that I was just asked to go figure out. And I was reading the local pollution act on the airplane on the way to New Orleans and figured it out. And we did it, and that's um, something I'm very proud of. Um, I also um, helped the, the U.S. Justice Department develop a legal brief that won a landmark case for the U.S. government and the U.S. Court of International Trade um, with regard to dolphin conservation. Um, and so that was a very proud moment. I have been repeatedly um, throughout my 21 years career, not just like at NOAA, but in the field, I have been repeatedly sexually harassed and bullied and discriminated against, and that's not an accomplishment. But now that I'm in a position of power and influence, I can tell you that it takes me, um, it's a very proud thing to say, I can turn the tables on these people and help enact policies that protect men and women. In, uh, across the in the field. I mean, the field is the field, right? You're on a beach, you're in the marsh, you're on a boat, um, you're not in an office, so it can be it's particularly challenging. Um, I've also been pretty uh, good at developing some budget execution processes for NOAA that are stuck around. It sounds like bean counting, but if you don't count the beans, you don't know how much you have and how much you need, so I think that's pretty important. Um, I also uh, led the U.S. delegation to Canada. Um, but I led the U.S. delegation to uh, got consensus on the first voluntary, now mandatory, high seas marine protected area in the Southern Ocean to protect deep sea corals and sponges. That was a very, very proud moment. I spent a fair bit of time working with the treaty system, um, getting binding uh, measures for seabird conservation in Long Lake 
chains and tin cleats around the vault, um, as well as dolphin protection. So those are very proud ones for me. Um, I was asked to give the commencement speech for my graduating class for the Normal Leadership Fellowship Program, so that was cool. Um, I'm frequently the only woman at the table. <laughs> Um, at high level meetings, even at NOAA. Um, and so that is something I will keep track of. I notice um, that every time. Um, I went back and got my master's degree about 10 years after I got my master's degree. So I have a master's of science. I really have no interest in getting a PhD, although I admire those um, who do that. Um, I've had the opportunity to live in Alaska and California and Tasmania, um, all while maintaining the residence in the Washington, D.C. area, working for NOAA. So that's been pretty. Um, to see the world that way. Um, I have known across NOVA as a champion of diversity and inclusion efforts and recruitment and engaging employees, and that's something that I'm very proud of and I thought that would be neat, but it is. Um, and I spent about three years as a special assistant to um, the head of one of the NOAA line offices, the National Fisheries Service. Um, and now I am the leader of the National Ocean Service and have a special assistant. It's pretty cool to have that come full circle. So that's not a strategic approach to a career. Um, the thing that I find common between all of those um, activities and all those opportunities is that I just said yes. Um, I said yes a long, long time ago to taking care of the oceans and the communities that depend on them, the animals and the ocean and all of that. And so I just got in yes mode. And whenever an opportunity presented itself, it looked like it was worth doing for ocean conservation um, or for coastal community resilience. I just kind of said yes if I thought I could contribute to it. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time asking myself as I go through my career. And so what that has done over my career, and I was thinking about this recently, I was in Alaska and I was having a breakfast smaller than this at our Pacific and Bay lab, and there were several PhD students there, and they asked for me to tell them. And, you know, it's five in the morning and less coffee than I'm on now, I'm trying to be coherent. And um, I was realizing that um, most of my career, every jump I've made has taken a ton of courage. And every jump I've made has been very different than the last. And so what, what I have struggled with throughout my career is trying to, in that moment, figure out how the next opportunity um, is going to get me anywhere more than the last one, and then how the last opportunity one. And sometimes that's just not evident. You just don't know exactly how that one thing is going to help the other. Um, and so getting comfortable with saying yes and knowing that you're contributing and you're going to be affected with something, um, but not quite knowing exactly where that is in your path, is I think that's okay. Um, I mean, I don't like bumble into things. You know, I look at it and decide that that's somewhere I can do good for the ocean and, and or Noah. And then I say yes and I kind of own that. But pretty much always out of my comfort zone, um, which is odd because I feel like it's something to get into my comfort zone and it's going to be easy, but it never really seems to do that for me because I keep getting sort of pushed out of it. And so when I was talking um, to these folks in Alaska and they were asking me, you know, where's your path and what does your career path look like? Um, I had sort of an epiphany, again, this was just a few months ago, I had this epiphany. I recall the view out of the airplane from Anchorage to Homer, and I don't know if you've ever spent any time in Southeast Alaska or in South Central Alaska, but it's stunning. Um, and there's no, there's not many roads, right? Alaska is largely unroaded, um, and there are no straight rivers. There's absolutely none, um, and they're all very, very windy, like so much so you expect these oxbows to form just pretty much every day. Um, it's very complex, it's very intricate, it's marsh, it's tundra, um, it's so many rich and diverse habitats. Um, and it's not a path in the woods. I, mean, I was thinking the very same thing. Like if someone said, go from here to here, walk through the woods, right? I wouldn't do it like this with so much inefficiencies and so many opportunities to get lost, right? I would walk straight through. Um, but when I think about what makes the Alaskan landscape and watershed so resilient, so robust, so productive, the most amazing home for you know, so much wildlife, some moose and some eagles and some bears, um, that, that 
that same windingness. If you if you just don't let yourself get wound out of control or too stressed out about uh, the choices that you make, um, what I have found, in, at least in my career, is it's the windiness that makes your um, each experience contribute to the next one. And I was sitting and thinking, I was like, oh my gosh, well, all of that water runs to the sea. Every river in Alaska still runs to the sea. It still gets to the sea. So if you if you try and find that path, it's straight and you get stressed out about getting back off that path. What you're going to miss is all of the winds and the twists and the turns that actually make your career potentially more robust, um, more resilient to um, setbacks and change, um, and and pick up all these skills and, and um, experiences along the way. And so I would totally agree with get too stressed out about making the exact wrong decision or having a path that's faster than somebody else or the same case. Because if, if if all you do is take experiences from one and apply them to the next, then you're on your path. You're absolutely on your path. And um, yeah, and I, and I appreciate the opportunity to just really think about that. And if you just Google Alaska River, right, you're probably not going to get this bridge and thing. You're going to get these huge, huge wines. And, um, and yeah, and so I would say just be better for the windingness and, um, yeah, and, and follow, follow that path. Um, but don't get wound up if you're not sure that's a path at all. Because you might be going the right direction. Okay, okay so I'm, I'm hoping that the thesis that will emerge from what I'm about to tell you about my career will be there. Careers are initiated and enhanced by mentoring. And mentoring can take many different kinds of forms. <clears throat> I wonder if Charles Darwin really would have signed up for a five-year research cruise um, to South America and around the world, and he was susceptible to sea sickness, if he hadn't had an instructor um, by the name of John Edmondson at Edinburgh University, who uh, was his taxidermy instructor and was a former slave in South, Carolina, in South America. Um, uh, Darwin admits that he was a uh, engaging conversationalist and undoubtedly told him many stories about wildlife and vegetation and human condition and society in South America, and that this probably influenced his decision. Um, Another would be uh, uh, Matthew Henson, an African-American uh, senior leader of Robert Perry's polar exploration team that got closer to the North Pole than any other expedition. And I'm wondering if that would have happened if, if Matthew Henson, an African-American, hadn't lived intimately with the Inuits and become the only non-Inuit to master dog sledding and basically carry um, Robert Perry, who was very ill, to the North Pole and did, did, did all the heavy lifting, I would say. Um, one thing I am absolutely certain about is that Matt Gilligan would not have made several hundred scuba dives and studying the biogeography and ecology of fishes in El Golfo de California, Mexico, um, Sea of Cortez, Mexico, in the 1970s. If he had not been taught to swim at Hartford, Connecticut, by an African American, a black man, uh, who was the director of aquatics um, at the, at the uh, YMCA, and was the founder of the first scuba diving club in New England. And he was the most remarkable teacher I've ever had, because he, um, everyone in his class learned to swim. That it, not learning to swim was not an option in his class. And, and he would include stories, regale us with stories of, of sharks and moray eels and diving on wrecks and discovering wrecks and, and other kinds of things. And, and, and students and, and youngsters in the class, and this was the late 1950s. And youngsters in the class were having trouble. He did the one-on-one -on -one mentoring with joint free swimming. You know, he, he would go over and put, you know, put 
but it's handled really bad. So just relax. You know, I've got you. I've got your back. <laughs> you know, this is, you know, he inspired the confidence in anyone to be able to do something. So that was that that was an, an early so mentorship is planting the seed. Mentorship from my career is really all about intervention and this process of trust and confidence development. It's kind of a, a, a feedback loop. Um, uh, so mentoring is this uh, process. And I guess some examples would be, would be useful. For, for 19 years, I was a minority mentor for the UCB American Society of Knowledge and Oceanography. It's now the Association of the Sciences of Knowledge and Oceanography. And Ben Sucre at Hampton University had got the funding from the National Science Foundation and probably still has it to uh, invite large numbers of uh, students from underrepresented groups to those meetings. And it was an opportunity for me to bring my students from Savannah State University, and I served as a mentor for students from other places. So I got to meet students from Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges. Um, I, I, in, in one case, there was a young uh, Native Alaskan young man who was presenting a poster, and he handed me a poster of a student presentation at special students' sessions. Um, and he was in my mentee group, and he seemed very depressed. He was being very successful in science, and he was doing a presentation or a poster, but he was a little bit um, uh, depressed, and he said, you know, I, I've been successful, but I'm being pushed to graduate school, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that. And I totally understood that, because so many of my students in Savannah State College, State University, a first generation African American college students who, if you finish an undergraduate degree, there's a very high expectation in families that you show what that's good for. It's not always a good thing to say, I want to stay in school some more. You know, that doesn't that doesn't roll really well in home communities and especially in Native American communities, other kinds of things. It's you've got to come home and show us the bad value of your college degree to, to inspire the rest of the tribe. So um, I understood that and I said, no problem, no problem at all. I took a year off after undergraduate school because I was burned out after that time. Uh, so you do get burned out and I was burned out because my pre-college career was very undistinguished. In fact, uh, I'm not sure I would. I, I, I was not college material. Okay, I was being tracked into vocational things um, and others because I had confidence and, and um, you know other issues. And, and so college was not necessarily in my future. But the, the, the Vietnam conflict kind of moved me to find a college to go to. And, and I, my academic career did not start until college. So it's. Going to find people out there. There are geniuses in middle schools and other places who, if you don't, if you don't get them on a path that they are not going to be inclined with uh, from other sources, then they're lost to our future workforce forever. And so they need to be captured. So I told them it's okay to take a year off and do whatever you want. I did. I got I, between college. Graduate school, uh, I got into uh, waste management to some extent to make some money, and then I went hitchhiking and traveling around Europe and North Africa to get in touch with uh, sort of a laboratory field exercise in humanity that I felt I needed to get some international experience, and that was the best thing. And somewhere along the line, I made the decision okay, I'm ready to go back to graduate school. You know, I busted my butt had good grades, and that stuff doesn't get old. You can, you can defer graduate school if you want, and you know, get out there. I found in graduate school that there were a lot of students who had done things and gotten jobs that really got rolling much faster than the other students who were tracked right into graduate school from, uh, from uh, 
undergraduate. So, um, so it, it, from my perspective, in a minority serving institution, uh, intervention is, is really a key. And I know that, I, just an example, um, that it is the culture to, uh, you know, if a student is not doing well, it's not the student's fault. It, it, it could be your fault for not finding out why. And so if you ask a student, you know, you know you've not been coming to class on time, what's up with that? Oh, I don't have a watch. This was back in pre handheld days, and, and students would not allow me. I bought him a watch. Not a big deal. But that now the excuse over, he came to class on time from then on. You know? Or a student that's not doing well. Um, and this is not the culture of majority and research ones institutions where they are senior staff. But you can, as an individual instructor and teacher, do this and say, can I see that in class? You know, I notice your grades, you know, you're really smart, you have really good comments and questions in class, but your grades are not really, um, you know, you're, you're talking out there. And in the office, they just kind of go, thank you for asking. You know, my family has some issues with health or legal, or I'm taking care of family, or, you know, there is something happening that together you can help intercede with and find support systems for. More than 90% of the time it's financial. And finding finances, the biggest success, we're talking about successes and failures in a career, my biggest successes have been engineering uh, research and education grants to provide undergraduate research support so that they don't have to work in retail or, uh, or restaurants so that they can work at the university to make ends meet in an academic department of their choice. So that, that and this, is, this is a key. Another uh, best predictor of future success is undergraduate research experiences, you know, summer REU type programs and other things. And I engineered with uh, Dr. Sue. Sue Cook at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution, an unsolicited proposal 20 some years ago now to bring early undergraduates in, which screens in many more underrepresented groups. And they, they thought they did, and it was very successful. It's still going on today, and not only that, but the formal model for our use was upper division undergraduates, pre graduate students. No must, no plus, integrate them into a, into a lab situation, a marine lab or an oceanographic institution. The pre RU concept is one of more teaching transition to options and finding mentors, but still doing research projects, and then using that to leverage confidence into any RU in the world that they want to apply for. So, this early transition is important because with underrepresented. The, you know, there is a huge negative pressure for the highest achieving STEM students at, when I, when I say historically, uh, well, minority serving institutions, that includes historically black colleges, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges. Um, there's a huge negative pressure away from the, from the financial rewards and biomedical, and no matter what their inclination is, they're going to go where the support exists. And so my biggest company was equally the biomedical support scope at, at an institution um, that would draw in those super achieving freshman STEM directed kinds of students. And that is so key. That is still key. Anyway, um, uh, well, big, my biggest failures were certainly pre-college, but after that, it probably has been my lack of success in influencing my colleagues at marine laboratories, oceanographic institutions, research one universities, uh, to take advantage of collaboration with minority-serving institutions and to reinvent uh, 
support systems to become more attractive to underrepresented groups. Uh, uh, trying to get colleagues to, to uh, uh, you know, live up to or, or make research and implement the criteria to broader impacts um, of research on society and the participation of underrepresented groups in all research proposals. You know, it's not something that's expected tremendously through the agency, but there are some emerging opportunities that, that might help. Um, and to test this hypothesis that, uh, you know, because you know, basically when I got to Savannah State College, you know, the culture of the institution is supportive and they serve, it serves a lot of access roles to a community. And in so doing, the obligation is to be nurturing and supportive, like a small undergraduate institution, I guess. But it's, 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 it's accepted and it's part of the culture. It's not part of the culture in departments, geosciences departments, more widely to be able to take that approach. Um, so I'm testing this, this hypothesis that you know, I, I did and it ended up being pretty successful because, well, um, I learned and was mentored at Savannah State College that if someone isn't doing well, it's not their fault. It's your fault for not asking why and seeing if you can together do something about it. Um, and in, in the end, um, that, 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 that became a very productive approach. So I guess I, I just wish that um, Research One universities and others would partner. And the biggest partnership we ever had, besides Harvard Ranch Ocean Graphic and getting our U program going, was Skidaway Institute of Oceanography right across the marsh in Savannah, Georgia, a collaboration between the great research and education. Um, that transformed both institutions. It brought more research resources to a historically black college. It, it brought more undergraduates and finally graduate students and finally full staff. And now you see one of the few examples of a new laboratory or oceanographic institution with social diversity in the laboratory and on the ships. So I hate to catch it off, but I have time for questions. Okay. It's, it's 8 30 now, and I think we want to spell that out a little bit early so that you can make it to the, the next live broadcast that they have. Um, so, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, this mic and the audience is live, so you can walk right up there and ask your questions. If you want to, I guess, queue up and uh, take your turns. If you don't have any questions, I want to ask some. Um, so, I'd love for someone in the audience to ask first. Can you because yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. And also for the panelists, really speak into the microphone because apparently the sound's not very good. Okay, I don't know um, So you guys all touched on diversity in your careers, and I was just wondering, after you were speaking, how you all have promoted diversity, especially when you've seen it in the workplace, where it's lacking. <laughs> Best ways that promoting diversity. Well, see, my, my career was not so, I was always at one institution for my entire career. The kind of diversity, though, to, to speak about diversity, and historically, black colleges and Savannah State University is a very diverse institution. Um, the faculty are more diverse than almost any other, but typically you have a lot of African uh, faculty, Indian faculty. Black and white faculty, so it, it's it's multicultural to begin with at, at those levels. Among the, the, the international uh, components, enrollment ebbs and flows over time, and our marine science program at the undergraduate level has always been diverse, 50-50 black and white with, with others as well. Graduate program not so much more. Um, so promoting diversity at our institution has not been a, a huge challenge. 
I've seen the challenges, and I understand well the challenges of not having diversity around the table at higher levels. And for many years, um, you know, you, you end up, you know, I go to meetings and I serve on boards and other things in DC, and uh, you know, have to DC quite a bit on uh, uh, participation with things. And when there is no, uh, when there are no people of color around the table, I own, I, I, there was an angry black man emerged from me, <laughs> if I may say, and I spoke for the people who were not present, because some of the things that I heard were, it was the implicit bias and uh, microaggression that, that women and minorities detect in the gatekeeping society that we have. I think, yeah, I would certainly second that. I think the first thing is to, and I have a lot of growing uh, I'm aware of and still what to do, is to be aware of uh, a lack of diversity, be aware of the size of my own bubble and what I'm living in, and to continually be open and, and positively trying to grow that bubble to include more. And uh, the message from, uh, from my heart is that. It's easier to form a team if you have a bunch of people who are not so diverse because they come from similar cultural or behavioral backgrounds. It's more easy to have them all aligned. Um, it's easier to form that team, but inherently that team will never be as high performing as one which you could have formed with greater diversity if you are successful in bringing a bigger diversity of opinions and cultures to alignment behind some common vision. Because if you get that, then you have the richness and the robustness and the adaptability that comes with many different ways of seeing a problem, many different kind of ways of thinking about it and offering solutions. And uh, for me, one of the gateways to achieving that is to uh, bring people onto projects, hire people onto uh, to staff, without regard to the labels that people have been sticking on them along their path and just taking each person at face value and asking really only one question and that's you know how what have they got to bring to the table to contribute to this enterprise and valuing their results not their pieces of paper uh, valuing people by what they contribute and the, the results they get and having people come on board I've always found it works a lot better than somebody may not have the right technical background, but they have a willingness to learn. They may not have the right piece of paper, but they're not letting that stop them to take something on and growing to, to encompass that. And hiring those are the right people, for me, has been, uh, I've been best at hiring people who have just innate potential and then letting them grow into a, a role, rather than looking for the right fit in terms of the labels that people have got to, to gather. So, um, in the federal government, we have uh, a lot of structure in terms of our hiring and recruitment and that kind of thing. And so, um, some of what we've been working very hard at is even just tweaks in those hiring processes. For example, um, interview panels now at the National Ocean Service have to have um, certain criteria of diversity. It's not just um, you know, men and women and people of different color, it's also people from it's also people from different offices. We want really diverse hiring panels. We want the folks that come through the door to be examined with different lenses and not just the two or three people that they're going to be working with, although there will usually be someone from the team there. Um, we also um, are looking into, and this is tricky, looking into redacting certain information from resumes um, when we bring people into leadership programs and, and um, scholarship programs and that. You have to be careful about that. You can't redact everything. Um, but where there is um, gender or ethnicity or um, some sort of cultural reference in there, um, we're having folks work with you know, work with attorneys right now to figure out what's appropriate to redact so that um, you don't just see that you're getting experience, right? Not um, before you even decide who you're going to interview. Um, we have a, a diversity of um, uh, pipeline 
uh, programs, like some of the internships that are um, mentioned in the brochure. Um, but I, I, you know, so there are structural things that you can put into place, and you can make sure the offices throughout the organization are doing those things. Um, I will always hire on merit. I will always hire on merit, and that merit may be who's going to work the hardest, who's most open to learning, who's going to be a good fit for that team. It may not necessarily be exactly what degree um, program they come from. It might be, it might not be. Um, I was also told multiple times it was not college material. So thank you to all the adults that told me that. I was young. Thank you. <laughs> that uh, piece of wisdom. Um, but um, I also, I'll say something that's a little unconventional uh, because now I'm the boss of um, so many. Say very affectionately, older white dudes, um, <laughs> and, and they often come to me with, you know, full of their heart and say, "How can I represent diversity and inclusion in working?" So we, we talk about that and we counsel a little bit toward that. One of the things that I remind them, um, which they all have fantastically, fantastically successful wives and daughters and all that, so we sort of connect with why they're coming to me and wanting to be a champion. But one of the things that I remind them, and I, I remind. Young, or people young in their careers as well, is I do believe that it is um, more intuitive and more natural, and I think it's wonderful that this can be the case, to be mentored by someone that you look like or that relates to you. you know? um, it is more intuitive. It feels more natural for a young woman to say, hey, I want to be like that older woman, so I'm going to pick her as my mentor. Or for a black man to say, there's a black man, I'm going to pick him as my mentor. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. That is perfect. But um, you know, here's a fine example right here. Um, and throughout my career, without older women to be my mentors, um, I had just a cast of so many gracious and wonderful mentors who were older white dudes who didn't look like me, but who lifted me up. And so I tell people of what it is a matter of what you look like. You know, look for mentors that maybe don't look like you because they're out there um, and there are folks that are trying to um, just to really be open and inclusive about your ideas and your thoughts and your skills. Um, but yeah, it took me like halfway through my career before I really had women in positions of power to say, hey, can you sort of mentor me? Um, I might look at it from afar, but um, I would challenge you to just not, not only look for people that remind you of yourself. Your own horizon um, to that mentor might be because they're out there. Um, and it's, you know, it just might not be easy to. I agree with what John was saying. We work in the international organization, so we have people from 28 different countries, plus the people that have built some ships. We have Brazil, Peru, one Greek, uh, one Italian, three Portuguese, uh, another Italian, one French. And you think that was a culture is very similar, so very much easy, it's not like that, you know. Uh, even among South Americans, all in the Portugal, France, and all the same, you know. So sometimes it's harder to get the team, you know, to work well at the beginning, but at the same time, you have people with different uh, viewpoints, so it actually brings much more value if you're a diversity than all of us are projects. It's easier to be one of the language, you need to be English among ourselves, but then you can have only one thing, so having such a large background. Um, do a little bit of, bit of um, cut and 
paste and uh, uh, table it and then file it off. And I think employers are getting very tired of the resources that it takes to filter out all the folk who are not actually really interested in that much of the job. They don't even know that much about the job. They haven't done much research. They're not applying because they want this job. They're applying because they want a job. Um, and of course, the, this, uh, this tech war is um, growing on both sides. And so now most employers have software robots which will go through and uh, read your CV on behalf of the real person and attempt to withdraw, uh, take out the important bits to see whether you actually meet the requirements of the position um, and whether you should be even looked at by you. And that, that is, I think, an unfortunate turn of events, which is putting up barriers between good people and uh, good, good, good organizations or being able to find and so from the applicant's point of view, I would say um, see if uh, you find opportunities that you really feel would be a good fit. And it's not a matter of trying to win the lottery. It's not a matter of getting the prize. Uh, as an applicant, uh, it's an exchange point where you and the potential team that you might be joining each have to work out whether you're a good fit for each other. So it's not a one-way business. Um, it's just as important that you work out that the people you might be joining up with are people that you think that you can you can work well with, that you can contribute your value. Because at the end of the day, if you feel ignored in a position, if you're not contributing value, if you've not got into a relationship with the team that you're with, it doesn't matter how much they pay, you're going to be miserable. You're not going to be doing a great job. They're not going to be getting value. You're going to feel devalued, um, and it's not going to last. It's not going to be successful. So I think, in my in my thinking, it's very much a two-way process that you and the slot have to fit. And if you don't fit, it's not because you're the wrong shape. It's just one of you square, one of you round, and you better go find something else. I have a. I have a different take on getting jobs. And, and, uh, it, uh, forgive me if I'm, wrong, if I'm wrong, but ocean science and technology is not a huge world. I mean, it's a, it's a community. It's a smaller sort of thing. One of the advice that I give to students is, um, uh, you know, job postings tend to be wired. They know what they want. They're advertising because it's a legal but they've been lining this person up. You uh, said So please forgive my cynicism for a moment and to capture this, uh, this strategy. So my strategy for students has been decide where it is you would like to work or, or, or go to school, go there, and insert yourself like a retrovirus into the machine <laughs> of organization. Give the biological part, but you know, you, you go there and you introduce yourself. There's nothing like a handshake to introduce yourself. And this is me. There's, you'll get an application, and that might not show me, but you go in there, uh, you know, guns blazing, and, and uh, you insert yourself. And, and you know, I even know professionals that um, their spouse had a great job in the lab. They didn't, there was no position for the spouse who was equally professional and trained. And they went in, there was, a, there was a lab or a business or something in town, and they went, introduced themselves, and started volunteering. <laughs> and, and as soon as they saw this skill set, and said, hey, you know, we could use that, here's a, here's a job description wire. So uh, that, that's just another approach to getting jobs. And, and, and I always tell students that you know, shotgunning, just, it, you can go to three places, you know, say, I would like to come for a visit. I think your graduate school might be a good fit for me. And I'd like to come and I always, you know, say, you know. And I have, you know, I'm, I'm also happy. Whatever, you know, throw that in there because
because I think there's a lot of money that goes to waste on travel to try to diversify to science graduate programs. And it goes on spent, and it's really up. They're not going to advertise. So there's, there's other kinds of things that uh, <coughs> you do to uh, <coughs> sort of from that side of things. Well, we're almost out of time. I just want to echo what they're saying about introducing yourself and networking. And events like this is a great opportunity to network and introduce yourself and go and find those places that you want to work with. You know, hit the exhibition hall, hit the talks, find the people that are doing what you're interested in, and just go talk to them and let them know that you're interested in. Find out if there's any opportunities, if they have internships. There's all kinds of programs, especially if you go to the universities, where you can get paid you know, to, to get your education or to you know, do an internship and get trained up. Right, so it's definitely worthwhile to do that, and it is one of the best ways right now to get a job. I personally am also looking um, just to move. Uh, I'm trying to move up in the world. I work at the USGS, and I'd like to go up, and I, and I will take a look at Noah or, or the Navy you know, looking around. But it's difficult, right? So to find that job without first networking. So I have to do a lot of networking and, uh, and meeting a lot of really great people in the process. So I definitely recommend that that's the best way.